Hi friends, welcome to the War Heroes channel. Today, we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. Until now, I had had little opportunity to visit the troops on the immediate front line. Today, on the 19th December, I wanted to visit the ones I had missed and see for myself how it really was out there. Watch out that you don't end up with the enemy, said Paulus as I reported to him on my departure. I have entered the whole of the front on my map from the latest reports, General. My aim is to visit the 44th and the 76th Infantry Divisions. We started off at about 9 a.m. I did not know the driver. He had been commandeered from a division by our staff. On the way via Gonchara to Rasoshka, I witnessed the shattering scenes that were played out every day at the dressing stations, sick bays, and in the field hospitals. I got out in front of a hospital. In September, I visited a main dressing station near Gumrak, where the impression had dug deep into my consciousness. But what I saw in this hospital today was even more shocking, absolutely dreadful, ghastly. Half debilitated orderlies were taking the badly injured out of the many waiting vehicles around and taking them on stretchers to medical tents. There they lay on some bloody, dirty blankets until there was room for them on the operating table. The room was in a house about 15 meters long on whose entrance hung a Red Cross flag. In order to get in, I had to push my way through a number of lightly wounded, all wanting treatment. One of them begged me, help us, Colonel. We'd have been here three days without any attention. Most of us have frozen hands and feet. Forward of here, all the collecting points and dressing stations are full. The doctor sent us here. Out of a dirty, stubble, staring face blinked a pair of tired, feverish eyes. The hands of the soldier were bound with strips of a woolen blanket. I told him that I had come to speak to the doctors. Then I turned back into the building. Through an open door, I was able to look into a room full of wounded. These were tended cases waiting for transport. A shivering collection of white bandages and dirty uniforms lay closely together in rows on the ground, more or less covered in gray coats or scraps of cloth. In the adjacent room was the operating theater. As I appeared in the doorway, a man rushed towards me from those standing around the operating table. It was a doctor. Hollow-eyed, pale, tormented, he stood in a blood-soaked smock and smeared apron. For three weeks now we three doctors and twenty medical orderlies have been working day and night. Once, when a bomb ripped off half the roof, about thirty wounded and nine of our people were killed. Another time the Russian artillery had similar success with two hits. Now we cannot move any more because all our vehicles are out of action. We are completely full. Of course we help all the newcomers. We give them a plate of hot soup or a cup of tea change their dressings, and send the vehicles on to the city. The emergency hospitals have been set up there in the remaining buildings and cellars of the ruins, where these poor chaps at least have a protective roof over their heads. What do you do with the severely wounded doctor? We send them on by divisional ambulances to Potomac Airfield. The army surgeon arranges their flights out of the cauldron, Colonel. With our capacity here, there is nothing much we can do about healing. It is a misery. If you drive on, you will unfortunately see much worse than here. And so it was. On the road were stopped vehicles fully loaded with the wounded. But their wounds did not bother them anymore. They were literally frozen. The vehicle's fuel tanks were empty. Until the driver, usually the only one capable of driving, returned with his fuel canister after hours of seeking and begging. Such misfortune was inevitable. The fierce cold extinguishing the little life left in the weakened bodies. Nobody was looking after this dead freight. Usually, they were mercifully covered in a white blanket of snow. The light wounded and sick gathered everywhere where there were buildings, tents, or dugouts. In small groups, they trailed tiredly along by foot to the city. A few had the rare luck to get a ride on one of the vehicles that were still moving. During the heavy fighting of the summer and autumn, the city had been avoided by everyone who was not ordered to go into it. Now it was like a magnet that drew everyone. There they hoped to find shelter in a cellar, assistance from a medical unit, and perhaps even a plate of soup. Napoleon's beaten army must have looked similar when it withdrew to the west wrapped in blankets and bits of tent, with sacks and bandages on their frozen feet instead of boots. They were hardly soldiers anymore, 
they were a broken, disarmed mob. If they were to be saved, immediate medical help, food, and warm accommodation had to be ready for them. Every day's delay meant that it was too late for many. The adjutant of the 76th Infantry Division complimented my own impressions with a detailed report on the personnel situation. The casualties, especially sick and completely exhausted people, have been catastrophic for several days. The gaps among the infantry are ever larger. Those reporting sick are mainly too late, so there is nothing that can be done for them. How can that be explained? Until now, we have taken immediate countermeasures. Many soldiers report themselves sick for the slightest reasons. Just sick enough to get out of the combat zone for a few days, I interjected. That's right, Colonel, but it is different here. Not a few shy off from reporting sick because they fear being left behind in a fighting retreat. I think that most of the infantrymen not in the front line are sick. What is the mood among the troops? That is hard to say, Colonel. They were depressed when the cauldron was closed. When it became known that Halth had started a relieving attack, it raised their courage and hope. We believed that the encirclement would be quickly broken. Since then, eight days have passed, and there is understandably deep disappointment. There are individual voices harshly criticizing the high command, Hitler, the Nazi party, and the whole war. Even some officers do not understand the sense of this sacrificial holding on and the long wasting away of our army. But until now, the 76th Infantry Division has shown steadfastness in every situation. I interrupted the divisional adjutant. The symptoms you have described contrast with the behavior of the troops in battle. That is so, Colonel. When the enemy attacks, those who were cursing the Hitler only a few minutes before pick up their weapons. They fight sometimes because they have a panicking fear about captivity, at other times because they are waiting for Holt to open up the cauldron. How far has Colonel General Hoth got towards the enclosing ring? From what I heard before coming to see you, the relieving army is engaged in strong attacks by the enemy. They are only slowly gaining ground, but we hope that they will be advancing again in a few days. On my journey on to the 44th Infantry Division, I witnessed the same terrible scenes. I soon had the vehicle full of wounded. Mouths and eyes peered out of the blood-soaked bandages. The second one had his shot through arm in a sling. The Corps has received orders to extract companies from the city front and give them to the divisions of the Western and Southern Fronts. Have a look at the allocation plan at Elschlepp. Apart from that, we have decided to remove soldiers, non-commissioned officers and officers from staff, rear services, panzer regiments and artillery battalions. We are calling them fortress battalions. The various regiments have released their third battalions. There are enough battle experienced commanders there. Give me proposals for the personnel appointments. Has someone been made responsible for the setting up of these fortress battalions, General? Not yet, Adam. Who do you suggest? I am thinking of the commander of the 14th Panzer Division, Colonel Latman. He has a capable staff. His division exists only as small combat teams that are individually deployed. Good agreed. Latman has the makings for this role. Schmidt too values him and will say nothing against this proposal. In fact, Schmidt immediately approved when I took the matter to him. Yes, indeed, Latman is the right man for these emergency units. Will he too be delighted, General? From what I know of the mood of the troops, there is no great desire among either the officers or the soldiers to play a role in such a thrown-together fire brigade. If it goes as it is, we won't need Latman. He will soon come to order, said the chief of staff laconically. I was not happy about the business. Fortress battalions really nonsense when one thought how many of these soldiers had no experience of infantry combat. Most of them had been vegetating until now near the stoves in some bunker or other. Now they were being chased out into the icy cold and raging storms. Would they really be of any assistance in the hard fighting on the front? Back in my bunker, I went through the courier post. It consisted of the usual, promotions from the ranks for bravery before the enemy, awards of knight's crosses and German crosses in gold. The army personnel office gave notice of a consignment of decorations, iron crosses first and second class, as well as appropriate class, Knights' crosses and German crosses. In addition, almost unbelievably, there were two cases of Croatian medals when we had only one Croatian artillery regiment in the cauldron under the 100th Jager Division. 
This regiment was at the same time already being taken care of with the same metal in generous quantities, so that it had no further requirements. Already the next day, the metals arrived by courier aircraft. It needed four soldiers to move the vast container into a workroom. The boxes took up so much space that I could hardly turn around in the room. Senior Surgeon Major Kepper opened them with a hatchet. They were filled to the brim with Croatian war medals. It would be best, Colonel, if we send the boxes as they are to the 100 Jager Division, said Kepper. That makes no sense. They don't rightly know what they should do with them. I will talk to General Paulus about it. At supper, I talked about the awards that had been bestowed on the army. My description brought general laughter, but also anger that valuable cargo space had not been used for foodstuffs. I can give you further hair-raising examples, said the senior quartermaster. With the last machines came a dozen cases of prophylactics, three tons of sweets, four tons of marjoram and pepper, and 200,000 knapsacks of Wehrmacht propaganda. I therefore wish the bureaucrats responsible only had eight days of experience in the cauldron. Then they would no longer do such imbecilic things. I wonder too that Colonel Bodder has not prevented this when we have sent out so many requests for this purpose. I immediately protested energetically to Army Group Don and begged that in future the persons responsible at the dispatching airfields are better instructed and supervised. That is good, Konowski, intervened Paulus. I will also ask Manstein to ensure that such misdemeanors cease in future. Botter seems to me no longer to have any influence on our supplies. We should transfer suitable officers to take command at the dispatching airfields who have their own experience of our situation. I ask you, Schmidt and Konowski, to check over the problem and make me proposals. The following days passed without the awaited code word thunderclap from Manstein. Paulus and Schmidt spoke daily on the decimeter apparatus with the army group. As on previous days, I listened to and recorded in shorthand most of the conversations that Paulus had. As before, Manston put aside all questions about the situation outside the cauldron. On the 22nd December connection with the outside world was lost when the decimeter apparatus fell silent. Our troops on the lower chair must have been wiped out. So when our days, Days of useless discussions and inactive perseverance. The 6th Army Headquarters waited for the redeeming orders from above. Meanwhile, fell, froze, and hungered ever more thousands of soldiers, their vitality becoming ever weaker with this delay. Paulus and his staff saw that the main reason for the growing catastrophe lay in the stubbornness and lack of care shown by Hitler and the superior headquarters. Doubtless, they bore a considerable part of the blame. But did this not prove that our army headquarters, by dutifully holding out, was nothing but a well-functioning cog in the whole people-killing machine? Was it not thus also guilty? We were a product of Prussian military training, accustomed to obeying orders and ourselves then passing on a given order even if it made no sense, was murderous, barbaric towards our own troops. Above all, we were not educated in critical political thinking. We thus thought at that time that the catastrophe of Stalingrad was essentially a result of decisive military errors by the high command. That the Second World War started by Hitler's Germany was a crime not only against the people's attack by us, but also against the German nation, did not occur to us. And because of this, we did not recognize the deeper reasons for the defeat on the Volga, which lay not in individual strategic or tactical errors, but in the superiority of the socialist state and social system whose sharp sword was the Soviet army. We wondered about the strength and bravery of the Soviet soldiers in front of and within Stalingrad, and were astonished at the precision with which the Soviet operations were conducted, but we did not understand what drove them. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. Chapter 24 It was a gloomy Christmas festival. Towards 6 p.m. on the 24th December came the news by radio that Hoth had been obliged to retreat. We were as if stunned when a little later we gathered for supper with General Paulus. In his short speech, the commander-in-chief touched on Hoth's shattered relief attack and the collapse of the whole southern front. He spoke of the now severely threatened Army Group A in the Caucasus and the seriousness of our own situation. Despite everything, we should not give up hope. After a few words on the meaning of Christmas, he concluded, and so we too have gathered together under burning candles to think of our families back home 
as they think of us at this time. The crass contrast between the brutal reality of the war and the Christmas message could not be glossed over by words. Everyone realized that this evening, there was some very quiet thinking, almost the quiet of the grave. Some lit cannibals on the table had been decorated with balls and tinsel, and next to each plate lay a couple of cigarettes and two or three chocolates, which General Paulus had brought in a large confectionery box that had been sent to him from Romania. There was no post at all from home, no parcels, no letters were distributed. Heavy snowstorms had almost immobilized air traffic. My wife and daughter had sent me a lovingly packed Christmas present some 14 days, if not almost three weeks earlier, by post. It never reached me. I had not written about our hopeless situation to my relatives. Realizing how much my wife was suffering over the death of our son Heinz, but nevertheless, they surely knew that a disaster was looming over the area between the Volga and the Don. Despite this, several items that were flown in reached us very soon after supper that evening. Everyone wanted to be alone with their thoughts or to sit together with their closest colleagues. I too was expected by my staff in the room which served as our office. The brightly burning fire in the stove gave a little causeness. I had prepared a small present for each of them, some cigarettes or a cigar a few slices of crisp bread and biscuits wrapped in newspaper. The Army Group adjutant, Colonel Von Werder, had sent me two bottles of brandy, which I now placed on the table. Best of all was a small Christmas tree that one of the non-commissioned officers had made from a package from his wife that had reached him three days earlier. To all this senior surgeon Major Kepper had contributed some candles on a carefully shielded stand. They all looked expectantly at me. What should I say to these four comrades with whom I had worked for over a year and who had been soldiers long enough not to let me make a fool of myself? All were married, all had families. I told them truthfully about the events outside the cauldron. Then we talked about our homes. The four of them had received mail during the last eight days. Letters and photographs made their rounds. We forgot everything outside in this conversation. We chatted together happily for hours. The candles burned themselves out. The bottles were empty. Towards midnight, I entered my adjacent room and office. My driver added some sticks of wood to the crackling stove. I pulled off my boots and jacket, extinguished the light, and lay down on my camp bed. Thoughts went round in my head for a long time until I finally fell asleep without having come to any conclusions. When I entered the office the next morning, the first day of Christmas, my colleagues were seated at the table drinking a dark brew that called itself coffee and chewing the crisp bread and biscuits I had given them the previous evening. They wished me a happy Christmas and Senior Surgeon Major Kepper was the first to shake my hand. With his pale, sunken cheeks, he seemed even thinner and taller than usual. During the night, the hope of seeing his wife again had almost expired, and with the other three, things looked no better. I attempted to boost them up, but not at first. To do this, I had to lie. We had to have more work so that there was less time to think. I turned to Kepper, when you have finished your breakfast, come to me. Seeking distraction with work seemed to me to be the best, perhaps only way. There was not much more for an adjutant to do, yet something of an occupation could be created. Keppel put together the figures of how many soldiers and officers of the 6th Army were away at the time of the stopping of leave on the 19th November, thus were unable to return to their units at the end of their leave. Further, how many should have returned daily? That will soon be done, Colonel. From our Army's daily orders, we can ascertain how many men went off on leave daily. We only have to ask the 4th Corps for their figures. Give yourself time and make it exact, I repeated as the telephone rang. Schmidt wanted to see me when I came to him, he said. You know the situation, Adam. We must reckon on strong attacks in the west and south of the cauldron in the next few days. Our weakened fighting strengths will force us to reduce the cauldron. At the moment, there is no establishment to deal with our retreating troops. In order to establish it as quickly as possible, I must have our chief engineer, Colonel Sell, here. Radio Army Group with the request to fly in Colonel Sell. It will be done as quickly as possible, General. Sell is leading a battle group at Shur. Deal with the matter urgently. There are enough officers out there to replace Sell. Why should Sell have to be commanded to take part in our almost certain downfall? The new position could be taken over by any engineer battalion commander, and how would they dig into the stone-hard frozen earth? That is what went through my head. On the other hand, 
I would be happy to see my friend again. I knew Schmidt well enough to know that it was completely useless trying to advise him against his decision. So I went to the signals officer and sent the radio message. Finally, I sought out General Paulus. I had not seen him yet that day. Lieutenant Colonel Zimmerman directed me to his dugout. Paulus was there preparing a message to Army Group Don. As I entered, he was sitting at a desk. My Christmas wishes he returned most heartily and offered me a chair. The question regarding the chance of a breakout was still open and lay burning in the air. Hold on, the 6th Army is fulfilling its historical mission on the Volga. Paulus quoted the first sentence of an order from Hitler. My hands are tied in every way. I understand you, General, but what sense does this holding out have now? We will not get out of here anymore. Can we reply that the whole army is going under? You know the orders. The formation of a new defensive position in the southern sector depends upon our holding on. I am responsible if Army Group A suffers the same fate as us. Six weeks have passed, General, since the order was given. In my interpretation, it has long since been overtaken. That is not quite correct. Manston informs me that Army Group A is holding on to its positions in the Caucasus as before. I don't understand that the Army High Command had six weeks to withdraw the troops from there to shorten the front. That would have freed up Panzer divisions to support Hoth's attack. There is no sense in going over these questions, it is too late now. Even if we want to, we cannot now get away from here with our broken, emaciated army. The German main front line is hundreds of kilometers away from us, and it apparently has to withdraw even further. No one will help us out. I spoke to all the commanding generals divisional commanders and Schmidt at the end of November and recommended we break out on our own, but Hitler was immediately informed by his liaison officer, Major von Zitzwitz, who has his own radio, and introduced his countermeasures. Paula stared for several seconds at the plank wall of his dugout. Then he turned his gaze on me. He saw from my expression that his comments had not removed my doubts. You are not happy with our discussion. I know what you are thinking. You are comparing my handling of the situation with that of Reichenau last year when he initiated the attack on Donitz against Hitler's orders. When I nodded, he went on. It is conceivable with that daredevil Reichenau that after the 19th November, if the 6th Army had fought through to the West, Hitler would have declared, Now you can go over my head, but you know, Adam, I am no Reichenau. Paulus had really guessed my thoughts. He spoke the truth as if he himself, as a loyal general, characterized the careful assessor, the overthoughtful waverer. But even with this self-criticism, he did not cut through the vicious circle in which he, I, and many others were entangled every bitter day. Whether Reichenau or Paulus, both men's intentions were aimed at the continuation of the war. A correctly timed, successful breakthrough by the Sixth Army would perhaps have postponed the final defeat of Hitler's Germany, but it could not have prevented it. Such a result would not have changed the imperialistic, anti-national character of the War of Conquest. Would the Sixth Army really be saved if tens of thousands of those who survived on the Volga were slaughtered in the subsequent fighting? But on the 21st December, we were still far from such insights. We simply functioned correctly and badly as cogs in the heavily laden German war machine. When I returned to my dugout, Kepper had laid out the required material. At the beginning of the counteroffensive by the Red Army, some 25,000 men were on leave. Every day, about 1,000 men had returned to the front. What happened to these leave people, Colonel? If they were here, we could close some of the gaps. Presupposing that they are meanwhile not also starving or frozen. Apparently, General Pfeffer was to collect them together and make them available to the Army. But that came to nothing. On the orders of Army Group Headquarters, all those returning were put into the battle groups. Oddly enough, every day some of those returning from leave are flown back to the cauldron on the supply aircraft. I telephoned several of the divisions today in order to get the precise figures for the information you required. One clerk told me that whenever the aircraft carrying these men arrive, an announcement is made over the loudspeakers instructing every officer and soldier to report to the railway station commanded. Nevertheless, some make their own way and ask for the airport, where the pilots take them on as machine gunners. If these unsuspecting fellows had known what was happening here, they would certainly have remained outside. I can thoroughly understand that, Kepper, but that is the comradeship that forms in pleasure and sorrow. 
it brings back many to their units. Colonel Elchlep visited me on Christmas Day. Is there anything new? I asked him, after we had shaken hands. Has Schmidt told you about the long-distance telephone conversation he had yesterday with General Schulz of the Army Group? No, was there anything special? There is nothing new from the Chur front, Schulz said, however, that the 6th Panzer Division has been withdrawn from the Hulth Army to protect Morosovs. The pilots of the supply aircraft report that the left wing of Army Group Don has been withdrawn to the west. Until now, it has not been possible to check the enemy offensive. It seems to me that the Army Group wants to keep us in the dark over the whole situation as before. In any case, it confirms that there is no longer any escape for us. The 6th Panzer Division forms Halt's main striking force. If it is unable to overcome the enemy, then things will not go well. It is clear that Hoth and the two remaining weak panzer divisions will have to withdraw. Doubtless Manstein realized the new catastrophe as early as the 16th or at the latest the 18th December. It is incomprehensible that he should not have informed Paulus and given the code word thunderclap. The order for the breakout would have doubled the strength of our soldiers. Every following day that uselessly passed, Army Group told me we should have initiated thunderclap. Fuel and supplies would have been flown in, but only when the weather was suitable. That is clearly a mockery, Elchlep. What do Manstein and his staff then really think about the state of the 6th Army? That has nothing more to do with military necessities. I share your opinion. Paulus is writing a new report on the pitiful state of our divisions. The following day, this report went to the Commander-in-Chief of Army Group Don. It ran something like the following lines. Bloody losses. The cold and insufficient supplies have allowed the fighting strength of the divisions to sink drastically of late. I therefore have to report. 1. The army can repel weak enemy attacks as before and still deal with local crisis for some time providing there are better supplies and replacements flown in. 2. If the Russians send stronger forces against Hoth and with these or other troops proceed to attack the fortress, it will be unable to resist much longer. 3. Breakout is no longer possible if a corridor has not been achieved and the army stopped with men and supplies. I therefore request that higher commands are made aware that energetic measures for the fastest relief of the army are taken. Otherwise, the whole situation will force them to become victims. That the army will do everything to hold on to the last moment is self-evident. The army continues to function. Today, only 70 tons were flown in. Red tomorrow, fat tomorrow evening. No supper for one corps. Drastic measures now urgent. The commander-in-chief of the 6th Army wrote a new message. Looking back, one must say that at this point in time, on the 25th December, as Manstein's strong 6th Panzer Division was withdrawn from Hoth's replacement army, hardly any more breakout orders could be given from our own resources. The 6th Army was now too depleted, lacking fuel, heavy weapons, tanks, and ammunition to attack the Iron Ring and the bitterly fighting Russians without substantial help from thrust from outside and establish a connection with the forces of Army Group Don. I believe that Paulus was unable to make any reproach if he himself was unable to make any decision of his own at this point in time. But how often had he, and all of us, not done so? All of us had dutifully reported, ordered and kept silent while there was still time through our own efforts to present the facts to the Supreme Command and save the lives of tens of thousands of soldiers who were later to be starved, frozen, and killed. This question and the resulting responsibility for the defeat of the 6th Army rested with all who had the highest command functions for clothing the surrounding units. The motives and considerations that had been played out in the decisive command posts of the 6th Army could be explained, but not excused. We were prisoners of the order and obey system, but was not that, when the order apparently went against the traditional Prussian-German military concept, itself immoral according to its moral code. Even more denied to us was the vote for the real alternative to the sacrifice of the Sixth Army ordered by German imperialism, the alternative that lay in a timely capitulation. We completely lacked the political insight for doing this. On Paulus's orders, all preparations for the breakout from the cauldron were canceled in the following days. The assembled trucks were sent back to their units. Captain Tooker resumed his place with the senior quartermaster, 
but was soon afterwards ordered to the airfields of the supply aircraft leaving the cauldron. At the end of December, Colonel Sell came to the cauldron. We shook hands with mixed feelings and I escorted him to the Commander-in-Chief's dugout. After he had given his report, we asked him to tell us how things looked from outside. Worse than we had feared, General. Before taking off, I was able to take a look at the situation map through my friend Colonel Bussing on the staff of the Army Group. Tazenskai was lost on the 24th December with the big supply depot. The airfield was taken by the Red Tanks in a surprise attack. Almost all the aircraft were captured by the Russians. That will have serious effects on the air supply for the cauldron. Morosovsk is also threatened. The battle is raging west of the Romanian 3rd Army. Milorovo was already occupied by the enemy, but is back in our hands. Battle groups, here and their whole battalions, were quickly brought forward to stop the enemy. The 6th Panzer Division was taken from Hoth on Manstein's orders. This and the threatened encirclement forced Hoth to retreat. Army Group A is still in the Caucasus. On the other hand, the headquarters of Army Group Don has moved from Novacherkask to Tagenro. In other words, Sel, we must finally bury our hopes of relief. Only one thing remains for us, to fight on and hamper as many of the enemy forces as possible, at least to tie up some of the enemy's forces and enable Manstein to establish a new front. Schmidt too had Sel report to him. Much less impressed than Paulus, he acknowledged Sel's account somewhat cheekily. The flag will not be lowered, old chap. The army commander-in-chief and his chief of staff took course for the defeat of the 6th Army. How much longer could our worn-out, lost mob hold out against the enemy's strong forces? What justified encouraging more than 200,000 soldiers to engage in such a questionable aim? Army Group Don telegraphed that our future signal's chief would be Colonel Van Hooven. His predecessor, Colonel Arnold, after being wounded seven times, was no longer fit for frontline duty. On the 28th December 1942, I stood for the first time in my life opposite my new comrade. He was tall and thin, had a clever small face, and showed himself extremely well oriented both inside and outside the cauldron. Tell me, Hooven, how is it that you are so extremely well informed? I asked him. I was commander of the Supreme Command Signals Regiment. Naturally, I had a complete view of events on all fronts in this position. On the 24th December, General Felgebel personally briefed me at Fur headquarters on my new task. On the 26th December, I landed at Army Group Don in Novacherkask. There I learned everything that I did not know until then. In the following conversations with Generals Paulus and Schmidt, Hooven confirmed what Sell had already told us. Hooven drew the situation more realistically, using his knowledge of the reports and orders that had passed through his hands at Fur headquarters. It appeared that the Army High Command still believed in the success of Hoth's action on the 24th December. Then General Felgebel had asked Hooven to pass his greetings on to Paulus and let him say that he was hoping to greet him personally soon. Hooven too had believed in the imminent relief of the 6th Army. His stop at Army Group Don quickly dispelled this illusion. Speaking to Paulus, he gave his opinion that an immediate breakout was the only chance of saving at least part of the 6th Army, as there were no more forces available for its rescue. As I appeared for the conference that afternoon, Paulus confirmed to me once more his standpoint expressed to Army Group Don on the 26th September. Hooven's proposal to break out of the encirclement is not achievable. I do accept that he is well in the picture on many things but the latest intentions of the Army High Command and Army Group Don are not open to him either. Schmidt was emphatically angry with Hooven and accused him of making a pessimistic assessment of the situation, saying that the will to hold on was paralyzed. In fact, there was much discussion among the staff about the description by the Army's Chief of Communications. Two groups began to form at about this time. While some of the officers believed that there was no longer any chance of saving the surrounded army, the others did not give up their belief in being liberated. If the Fuhrer knew, said some people, how it really looks like here, he would certainly take extensive measures. But it seems he does not get sight of our reports. Above all, the younger officers led by Elchleb argued this way. Under his influence, Paulus and Schmidt were persuaded to send an officer to personally report to Hitler. Then I received a radio message from the Army Personnel Office with the following content. 
General of Panzer Troops Hugh is to be sent to for headquarters to receive the award of the swords to the Knight's Cross with oak leaves. That is our opportunity, said Paulus, when he read the message. Hugh must give an unvarnished report on our situation. Hitler will listen to this highly decorated general. Schmidt put together immediately all necessary papers on supplies, ammunition, fuel, tanks, guns, especially about the fighting strengths and combat readiness of the troops, losses from gunfire, freezing and sickness, and also about the wounded and the difficulties of medical care. The reporting system continued to function relatively well within the war machinery of the 6th Army. As Hugh entered the headquarters, precise information lay on the table. Paulus and Schmidt added verbal instructions and asked the general about his personal opinion of being thrown into the scales in order to present a realistic assessment of our situation to Hitler. Hugh flew off the same day by courier machine. I am anxious about whether Hugh will be able to speak or whether Hitler will interrupt him immediately after the first sentence in order to keep all the unpleasant news from himself, said Paulus. These days many officers called in on me and sat around without a function because their units had been smashed. Some sought a new role, most asked for permission to fly out. Every day one of them could board the courier machine to Army Group Don. I had the task of recommending those to be sent out on medical grounds. This concerned, without exception, the older gentlemen who were deemed no longer fit for combat by the doctor. Major General Schmidt checked every case and decided by name. Only those who had witnessed the pitiless dying in the cauldron could have any idea. What feelings of relief these officers experienced when they had the order to fly out in their hands. Torn away from death, said many of them as they reported to me upon leaving but so many of them had not yet finished with the war in the years to follow until 1945. One day, the battlefield artist from Leipzig, who had appeared during the summer, came to see me. Under his arm was a packet of drawings, sketches for battle scenes. His face bore traces of the distress and suffering of the encirclement. I took the sketches to Schmidt and suggested we let the artist fly out. For us, he posed only an unnecessary burden and was not required as a combatant. Schmidt declined to make an exception. General Paulus, to whom I eventually went for a positive decision, shied away from correcting his chief of staff. So the painter became a senseless sacrifice to the beast of war, which his talent had recorded. He left my dugout completely broken. Kepper stood below the entrance. Post from the high command, Colonel, put it on the table. The senior sergeant major pointed to the letter on top. It was a long, detailed report from the 8th Corps about increasing appearances of disintegration among the troops. Since the failure of the relief offensive became known, the will to resist has fallen drastically, I read. The writer quoted reports of breaches of discipline, leaving the posts, going off to Stalingrad, refusal to obey orders, even self-mutilation. Even officers were beginning to act listlessly. We must now reckon with such tendencies, the commanders must get a sharp grip and re-establish order was how the usually strict Schmidt reacted to these signs of decline. Heights came after with the promotion of Schmidt. I heard of his order to the 8th Corps from Maria. I still remember that every paragraph began with the words, was shot, and then followed the offense, who left the position without an order having been given, who failed to carry out a given order, who made contact with the enemy, and so on. Paulus was more understanding. One should not forget what these soldiers have gone through in the last weeks. If they can only eat themselves full and sleep again, they will see everything with different eyes. Of course, General, this also plays a role, I interjected, but it seems to me that there is much more to it. In talking with young officers and soldiers, I keep coming up against deep doubts about the reasons for which they are having to fight. At school, at home, the Hitler Youth, the Nazi party and in the Wehrmacht was implanted with the feeling of the greatness of fighting for an honorable aim. They believed in the Fuhrer, trusted him, put their lives at stake. Now they are discovering that the promises are broken, their trust in the lies was valueless. That is especially painful and leads in many instances to positive breaches of discipline. As far as it goes with the younger men, it applies here and there. But there are also signs of resolve among the older ones. The report still indicates something else. Every night, apparently, Germans call through loudspeakers from the enemy trenches for our soldiers to give up the senseless fight. The Sixth Army has been betrayed by Hitler. 
They are to be sacrificed to his prestige. The speakers are German communists who immigrated to Russia. From pamphlets thrown over, we recognize the names of Olbricht, a former member of parliament for the German Communist Party, and of the writers Weinert and Bredel, also communists. I regard this propaganda as being of no great effect. We must watch out, of course, that no radical effects arise. In the meantime, it is enough if we keep on being aware that this is enemy propaganda trying to break our resistance. Incidentally, we must keep alive the hope of being released from the cauldron. Keeping the hope alive of being released, in which the commander-in-chief himself did not believe. Was that not the same as Hitler and the army high command were doing? Lies versus trust. Could an army commander take this course? Had this in view of the dying and suffering, not something to do with soldiery and obedience? These questions did not only come from me, they also came from Paulus himself, but they led to no consequences. The will to hold on took the upper hand. In this lay the combined guilt of General Paulus and all the military commanders in the Stalingrad cauldron, an historical, military, and human guilt. The Wehrmacht High Command animated Paulus in a way through its decision to hold out. At the end of December came a radio message from the Army Personnel Office. It terminated the Commander-in-Chief of the Army Special Authority, which until then only the Army Personnel Office had held, for the promotion of officers up to Lieutenant General and awards of the German Cross in gold and the Knight's Cross. Hitler wanted to relieve the dying. The favored awarding of the highest German awards and promotion from the ranks should convey the desired physic to the Sixth Army. There was another aspect to this that seemed important to me at the time. Promotion to the next highest rank meant the raising of the widows' and orphans' pensions. The divisions were informed of the rising chances of promotion. In the following period, the work in my section returned once more to full speed. On the 31st December, Captain Tuipke flew to Army Group Don, whose headquarters had meanwhile moved from Novakirkas to Taganro, about 200 kilometers further west. On the previous day, Paulus had personally tasked Tolk in Schmidt's presence with the task of being the Army Supply Commissioner. You will report to Field Marshal von Manstein personally and tell him that you have received the task from me for purposeful loading and complete use of the cargo space of the supply aircraft. You know what is happening here. Take all the papers on food supplies, ammunition, fuel and medical supplies with you and put them in front of the Field Marshal. Schmidt added, Take care that at last all available aircraft are placed at our disposal. The Army Group must stop sending dozens of Heinkel 111s to the abandoned Tazinsky airfield. Our soldiers are threatened with death by starvation. Report back to us when we can expect a better supply service. Manstein appointed the Captain Senior Quartermaster for the air supply of the 6th Army and took energetically applied himself to helping the surrounded Army. However, no noticeable improvement appeared. The loading space was far too little. Soviet anti-aircraft gunfire and the winter weather decimated the amount of goods being flown in. The distance from the source airfields and the cauldron was considerably increased following the loss of Morosovsk and Tazinskaya. The airfields at Shakti, Novoyferkask, Voroshilovgrad, and Sox lay 350 to 400 kilometers away by air. In a radio conversation at New Year, Hitler repeated that every member of the 6th Army could enter the New Year with confidence that the Führer would not lead the heroic fighters on the Volga in the lurch and that Germany would see to the needs of their commitment. At the same time, General of Panzer Troops Paulus was promoted to Colonel General. Loyalty to loyalty. There was then such an expression of Hitler's which, despite all the agony, was not totally without effect even if it was also questionably worded like a similar report six weeks earlier. The repeated exchanges, the inhuman privation, the hollow cheek dying had brought something to us. But we no longer saw the things as a whole. It was very difficult to see things as a whole, so the disaster continued.